Episode 31, Part 03, Chapter 31 Part 3, Chocobos, Parades An A-Ninja Chapter 31 It was a fairly long journey across the Midgar Plains towards the eastern part of the continent. Cloud and his team headed east across the plains. On their way they had to pass through a large valley that ran between two sets of mountains. The mountains to the right were the mountains that divided the whole of the continent, separating Midgar and Kham from the other towns that lay hidden on the other side. As they reached the mountains, the three stopped and turned to look behind them. In the far distance they could see Midgar, a solitary dark soul in the middle of the vast, dying land. It looked so alone where it stood, and they could only imagine the panic that would be sweeping through the citizens of the city now. The Shinra would probably be doing all they could to try and cover up the incidents of the tower, but who knew where the new Shinra president would be? He had flown off after his battle with Cloud, and Cloud got the feeling Rufus wouldn't be there for his father's funeral. Eris stepped forward and waved gently at the city. This was probably the last time she would see Midgar for a while, or her mother. She hoped that Elmira had managed to get away from Midgar and was safe. As she stood there, she got the feeling that Barrett had also stood here and looked at Midgar, praying that little Marlene was also safe. When she was done looking, she turned back to Cloud and Tifa, and they headed off once again, saying goodbye to Midgar one final time. Unfortunately, their journey was not as easy as their journey to Kham had been. A few monsters blocked their path as they went through the mountains, but they were easily dealt with. With each monster that went down, none of them could help but think of the capsules Cloud had told them about, wondering just how many monsters in the world the Shinra had actually produced. They soon emerged from the valley and into the open plains in the eastern part of the continent known as the Choco Plains. They were called the Choco Plains because they were reputed as being the number one breeding land for Chocobos. Of course Chocobos bred all over the world, but there were very few plains where the Chocobos were free to breed without much threat from hungry monsters. As they entered the plains, they were surprised to see very few Chocobos running around like they had expected. The Chocobos they could see were few and far between, and certainly seemed to be keeping their distance from Cloud and the others. It was almost as though they were scared. Which was strange, because Chocobos were usually very friendly. They continued on their way across the Choco Plains, eventually beginning to head south towards the mountains, for there were no other towns in that part of the continent except for a farm that was not too far away from where they were. As they headed south they saw the mountains gradually drawing closer to them, and saw that the land surrounding the base of the mountains was different from the grassy plains they were standing in. The short blades of grass turned into a thick marsh covered in large stalks of dying weeds, shielding what lay hidden beneath them. One thing was for sure, it wasn't a very hospitable looking place. Barrett and Red, 13 were already waiting for them there, standing at the entrance of the marsh and trying to see through the long weeds. The weeds were so tall they nearly towered over Barrett, and were so thick that they couldn't see more than a few feet into the marsh. Yo, Cloud! Barrett called, turning as he heard Cloud and the others approaching. He nodded his head towards the marsh. Looks we ain't going this way through. Don't look like nothing could get through there. Cloud, Eris, and Tifa came to a stop at the edge of the marsh beside Barrett and Red 13, and looked out at the marsh. Looking down, they could see the ground becoming swampy around where the weeds grew, thick and choking. You don't suppose Sephiroth went through this marsh, did he? Asked Eris. She sniffed deeply and a terrible stench from the marsh hit her nose. She curled her lip in disgust. The smell was terrible, it smelled of mud and dirt and who knew what else. Maybe, Cloud said, tapping his foot against the grass. This is the only way I know that leads to the other side of the mountain. We'll have to cross. At any rate, I don't believe it would be a good idea to cross the marsh on foot, said Red 13. He climbed to his feet again and walked past Cloud and Tifa, looking out towards the farm that stood a little way away. Perhaps we should go there and see if there is any other way to cross the marsh. The others all nodded in agreement, before they turned and headed off towards the farm. They walked away from the marshes in the direction of the farm, but Cloud remained at the edge of the marshes a few moments more, looking across the large plain of dying weeds towards the foot of the mountain. Cloud frowned. He knew Sephiroth had passed through those marshes, he could almost feel it. He could feel Sephiroth's presence in the air hanging around him, along with the deep hatred that he bore inside. He quickly turned away from the marsh and began to run after the others. And as he ran off, a loud and agonizing cry of pain and anguish echoed from deep within the marshes, but Cloud didn't hear it. Chocobo Farm The farm that they had spotted was actually a Chocobo farm, owned by an old man and his grandson. 
the farm was built specifically to tame and hire out chocobos for travelers wanting to cross the marshes or travel towards Midgar. The land that the farm was built on had once been a battleground a number of years ago during the last war. The consequences of that battle had led to the ground around the farm becoming lush, and chocobos began to breed there. Thus the farm was founded, and chocobos flourished. There were a number of chocobos already gathered within the farm, with about four or five of them standing in the large pen in the middle of the farm, enjoying the sunshine. They looked up as Cloud and his friends entered the farm, intrigued by their presence. Wark. One of the chocobos squawked at Cloud as he walked past the pen. Cloud stopped and looked up. The chocobo walked over and stuck its head over the bar, leaning over as close to Cloud as it could reach. It flicked its yellow head back. Wark. Wark wark. Wark. Cloud blinked. He was completely baffled by the chocobo's sudden interest in him, but he wasn't sure what the chocobo was asking of him. The chocobo wouldn't give up though. It stamped its feet against the sandy floor of its pen and flicked its head back and forth, demanding an answer. Cloud scratched his head. Wark, he said. That answer seemed to be enough for the chocobo. Wark, it said. All at once all of the chocobos in the enclosure fell silent, and Cloud and the others stared. Then, all at once, the chocobo suddenly began to dance. Each and every chocobo standing in the pen suddenly began to do the exact same things, bobbing their heads, fluttering their wings, jumping off the ground and landing daintily back on the ground again. It was a peculiar sight to see, chocobos dancing in unison. By the time the dance was over, the chocobos all returned to their usual state, carrying on with what they were doing before as though nothing had happened. Only the first chocobo close to Cloud remained where it was. It squawked at Cloud happily, before it suddenly dipped its head low behind the wooden bars and began to dig at the dirt with its claws. It dug up a small hole in the ground, and then stuck its head in the hole. It came back up a few seconds later, with something red and shiny in its beak. It flicked the object carefully through the bars of its pen, and Cloud caught it and looked down at it. It was a piece of materia, a very rare piece of materia. Cloud lifted it up and looked inside the red sphere. Through its semi-translucent surface he could see the faint image of a chocobo inside of it, along with a small figure on its back. He knew just what kind of materia this was. The materia must have been buried under the earth after the war, and the chocobos must have dug it back up. Summon materia, Cloud said to the others. He lifted up the blade of his sword where more materia slots were, and quickly slotted it in. Summon materia could be very useful, when used correctly. They soon left the marshes behind them and headed up to the main farmhouse. The door had been left wide open, and they could hear the sound of muttering inside. Slowly Cloud walked through the open door, leaving the others outside to wait, Eris was already busy petting one of the other chocobos in the pen. Once inside, Cloud could see the source of the muttering. It was coming from an old man, Choco Bill, the owner of the farm, who was standing in the kitchen beside the sink, talking quietly to himself. He didn't notice Cloud at first, and carried on talking to himself about Chocobos. Cloud coughed loudly to get his attention. The old man looked up and took off his hat, squinting through his eyes to see Cloud. He wasn't old, in age, but years of weathering from his farming had aged his skin. Thinking of crossing the marshes? He asked with a country accent. Cloud blinked. He wasn't wasting any time in getting to the point. Yeah, he replied. Hmm, old Choco Bill said, nodding his head. He put his hat down on the table. Then it'll probably be safer for you to get a Chocobo. He told him. He walked over to the kitchen window, which overlooked the marshes by the mountain, and looked out at them. Then, you can zip through the marshes with the Chocobo. It's the only way to avoid being attacked by the Midgar Zalem. Midgar Zalem? Asked Cloud, confused. Choco Bill nodded again and turned away from the window. It's a serpent-like creature thirty feet tall, he exclaimed, spreading his arms to emphasize the size of the creature. It picks up on footsteps that enter the marshes. And then, bam! It attacks. He slammed his hand on the table, making Cloud jump. He then picked up his hat and placed it on his head again with a certain flicker of pride, and then began to speak like a salesman. To avoid that, buy a chocobo at the Choco Bill and Choco Billy Chocobo Farm. To purchase a chocobo, please talk to my grandson. He's in the Chocobo stables at the far right end of the farm. Cloud nodded and turned back towards the door. By the way, Choco Bill added suddenly. Cloud stopped and looked back at him. There was another person heading towards the marshes. Without a Chocobo, the Midgar Zalem probably got him. He crossed his arms and looked up thoughtfully. 
It was a man in a black cape. That caught Cloud's attention. He stared at Choco Bill. At least that confirmed his suspicions, Sephiroth had crossed the marshes and was heading to the other side of the continent. He also got the feeling that Sephiroth was not going to have any trouble handling the Midgar Zalem, however big it was. He went outside, and he and Barrett headed to the stables, leaving Eris with her herd of chocobos that had come to her to be petted. Sure enough as Cloud entered he spotted the grandson, Choco Billy, tending to an empty stable near the back of the barn. He was only young, about twelve or maybe thirteen years old. The boy looked up as he heard the creak of the barn door and eyed Cloud and Barrett over with a quick, fleeting glance. Do you want a chocobo? He asked, speaking with a strong country accent like his grandfather. He looked at Cloud very curiously, as though he had never seen a man with a sword or a man with a gun arm before in the country. Hmm? Cloud muttered, also looking the boy over. Give me one. Choco Billy turned away and picked up a bucket of a peculiar vegetable. He walked over to another stable, carrying the bucket with him. You old folks are out of luck. Cloud tilted his head. Old folks? He scratched his head, confused. He could understand Choco Billy looking at Barrett and calling him an old folk, but he was only twenty-one. How did that classify him as an old folk? We're all out of Chocobos, Choco Billy continued, ignoring Cloud's puzzled face and Barrett's angry, staring glance and shaking fists. I'm taking care of those ones out there for someone else. He put down the pail by another stable and began to scoop out the wheat into a pail beside it. He then stopped and turned to Cloud and Barrett. You know, if you really want a chocobo, you should go out and catch on. Want to know how to catch a chocobo? Cloud and Barrett both glanced at each other with a look that clearly said they weren't particularly interested in being lectured by a kid. But then, neither of them really knew a thing about chocobos. How do I catch one? Cloud asked eventually, swallowing his pride for a moment. Choco Billy grinned and climbed up onto the top of the stable bars, and leaned against the pole. There are loads of wild chocobos in this area, he explained, grabbing a length of straw from the edge of the stable and chewing it. However they're mighty timid and a pain to catch when they're not tame. If you get a wild one angry, run like hell before you get a chunk taken out of you. He then suddenly jumped down from the bar and pulled out one of the peculiar green vegetables in the bucket he had been carrying, and threw it over to Cloud. That there is a geisel green, he said. Greens are Chocobo's favorite food. If you want to catch a Chocobo, you gotta keep it from running by feeding it greens. That should stall it long enough for you to catch it. Once you're on a chocobo it's pretty easy to get it under your control, just keep on it until it learns that you're in control. The rest is pretty self-explanatory. Oh, and one more thing. He added. Once you get off a chocobo, it'll run off back to its home. So, you gonna try? We have a variety of greens, but geisel greens are the cheapest at 20 gil. Cloud bought a couple of geisel greens, and he and Barrett headed back out to the others. After explaining what they needed to do to catch a chocobo to the others, they left the farm and went back out to the plains. Whatever had scared the chocobos before had obviously left now, for there were a few more chocobos roaming around the perimeter of the farm. They were, of course, wary of Cloud and his group as they approached, and very slowly and cautiously backed off away from them. How many are we going to have to catch? Asked Tifa, as they stood on the edge of the chocobo field, looking back at the wary chocobos. Cloud tapped his foot against the ground and folded his arms. I think, to get us all five of us across the marsh, we're going to need at least three chocobos. He looked at the greens he held in his hands. I hope we have enough of this stuff. Three will not be necessary, Red Thirteen said suddenly. Cloud turned. I am able to run through the marsh without any trouble, I will be able to outrun any serpent. Cloud nodded, and turned back to the chocobos. Well, I guess those two will do, he said pointing to a pair of sturdy-looking chocobos standing nearby, pecking at the ground. We'll have to give them the greens first, and then Tifa and I will try and mount them while they're distracted. And what the hell should we do? Barrett demanded. Barrett, you, Red Thirteen and Eris can help herd the chocobos and prevent them from running if we can't get them, Cloud said. Just be careful not to get attacked. He turned to Tifa. Are you ready? As ready as I'll ever be, replied Tifa. The group then parted ways and spread out around the two chocobos that they were targeting. Barrett, Eris, and Red Thirteen spread out in a wide circle around the two chocobos, while Cloud and Tifa advanced slowly towards the chocobos, each of them with a geisel green in their hand. 
One of the Chocobos looked up as they approached, and stared directly at Cloud and Tifa through its large eyes. It made a squawking sound and the two stopped in their tracks, freezing until the Chocobo was more relaxed at their presence. The calmer the Chocobos were, the easier it would be to capture them. After a moment or two the Chocobo fluttered its wings and lowered its head again. Only then did Cloud and Tifa begin to advance again. The second Chocobo then suddenly lifted its head and stared at them, and Cloud froze again. Only Tifa continued to advance, taking small, delicate steps towards the bird. The Chocobo tilted its head at her but did not seem to be panicked by her presence, so she kept on advancing, until she was within reach of the creature. Very carefully she extended her arm, holding out the Geisel greens with it to the Chocobo. The creature looked at the greens and squawked for a second, before it slowly leaned its head forward and took a step up to them, sniffing the greens carefully. It took another careful step towards her and put its head in her hands, taking the greens from her and beginning to eat them. Tifa then stepped right up to the Chocobo and gently placed her hand on the soft feathers on its head, riding her hand down its neck towards its wings. Her actions drew the attention of the first Chocobo by then, and was looking at Tifa with its companion with interest. It watched Tifa as she continued to gently stroke the side of the Chocobo's head. The Chocobo suddenly dipped its head down to the ground and bent its legs, allowing Tifa to climb up onto its back. She did so, and once she was secure on the Chocobo's soft, feathered back it stood up again, carrying Tifa with it. Cloud stared as Tifa gently dug her heels into the Chocobo's side, and the Chocobo began to walk at her command. The Chocobo was indeed very tame, much tamer than he had expected. He slowly began to approach the second Chocobo, hoping that its capture would be just as easy as the first one. Unfortunately it was not going to be as easy as that. As Cloud approached the Chocobo suddenly lifted its head and squawked very loudly, making Cloud take a step back away from it. The Chocobo made the feathers around its face, wings and back expand and flutter out, showing its discomfort of Cloud being so near. Cloud, said Tifa from the back of the first Chocobo. It doesn't like your sword. It feels threatened. Put it down. Cloud did as he was told and placed his sword down on the grass, and then took a step away from it. That seemed to ease the Chocobo's discomfort and it began to settle again, although its feathers remained slightly fluffed up, completely aware of Cloud's presence now. Hurry up, Cloud. Eris called out to him with a playful tone to her voice. We're waiting for you. He ignored Eris as he began to approach the Chocobo again, slightly nervous because it was much more wary now. He held out the greens he held in his hand as he approached it, hoping that would distract it long enough for him to get to close. The green seemed to attract the Chocobo's interest. It blinked and slowly stepped forward to him, sniffing the greens with care whilst keeping a constant eye on him. With a sudden snap it lurched forward and snatched the greens from Cloud's hand, pulling away again and beginning to eat the greens hungrily. Now's your chance, Cloud. Barrett said to him. Get it. Cloud quickly dashed forward and made a leap for the Chocobo while it was distracted. He took a firm hold of the Chocobo's strong back and jumped up, throwing one leg over one side of the bird and climbing up on top. The Chocobo reacted instantly, lurching upright and screeching so loud it nearly burst Cloud's eardrums. He wrapped his arms firmly around the Chocobo's neck and held on as the Chocobo began to run and bound around madly, trying hard to throw the ex-soldier off. Cloud held on as tight as he could, also wrapping his legs underneath its body to secure him, making sure that whichever way the bird twisted and turned, he would not fall off. Tifa sat on top of her Chocobo, rolling her eyes at the performance going on in front of her. The Chocobo ran round and round, but wherever it turned its path was blocked by Barrett, Eris, and Red 13, who continued to run around and prevent the bird from escaping. With one final, ferocious lurch the bird dipped its head forward and Cloud finally lost his grip, tumbling over the bird and onto the grass in front of it. The bird began to pound the floor with its feet around him, its wings flapping madly. Tifa dug her heels into the Chocobo she was riding again and headed on towards the spectacle. As amusing as it was seeing Cloud fall off a Chocobo, they didn't have time to waste. She led her Chocobo into the circle and whistled to the other one. The sound of her whistle made the Chocobo snap its head round and flutter its wings again, making a peculiar hissing sound from its beak. Tifa took another Geisel green she had been holding and held it out. She made a soothing, cooing sound in her throat as she walked slowly towards it. The sound of her gentle cooing made the Chocobo relax, and its feathers gradually softened until they were flattened again. Tifa threw the greens to it, and the Chocobo ducked its head down and began to peck at them. She then nodded to Eris, who walked over and mounted the Chocobo with ease. The Chocobo then stood up and cooed at Eris, who stroked its neck softly. Still on the ground, 
Cloud stared in surprise at the ease in which Eris had climbed up onto the Chocobo. The Chocobo was much calmer now with Eris in control, and was much tamer. He accepted the hand that Barret offered him and pulled him up to his feet, both of them in shock. Must be a woman thing, Barret surmised, and Cloud nodded. Like Tifa, Eris gently dug her boot heels into the Chocobo's waist, making it move slowly until it stood alongside Cloud. With a gentle tap on the bird's head the bird knelt down, and Cloud cautiously climbed on. The bird gave no reaction to him now and stood up the moment he was on, the extra weight meaning nothing to it. How do you know how to ride a Chocobo? He asked her curiously. You have to be careful with creatures like these, Eris replied with a smirk. They demand care and attention, not someone who will be forceful. She gave Cloud a playful wink. I would have thought someone in Soldier would know how to mount a Chocobo. Cloud frowned, and his face burned slightly. Eris just laughed and moved the Chocobo aside, allowing Tifa to move her Chocobo in for Barret to climb onto. Once they were ready, they headed back towards the marshes close to the foot of the mountains, and stopped beside them. The marshes were deadly silent and eerie, and now, mounted on the Chocobos, they could see clearly over the top of the grass. It was a field of grey, seeming to sway and flutter like sand blowing and swirling in the breeze. There was another scent in the air now, they noticed, and it made Red Thirteen wrinkle his nose in disgust. It smells of blood, he said, growling deep in his throat. Red Thirteen, are you sure you're alright running through here? Eris asked, concerned. I don't like the look of this marsh. Do not worry about me, Red Thirteen assured her. The smell might be repulsive, but I am a fast runner. You run ahead, and I will follow you through. Okay, said Cloud. Let's go. End of chapter. Episode 32, Part 03, Chapter 32 Chapter 32 An eerie, somber silence spread through the group as they stood at the foot of the mountain that would lead them to the other side. Their eyes were open wide, their pupils dilated, as they looked on in horror at the sight that lay before them. As they had traveled silently through the marshes they had wondered why it had been so quiet, so easy, until they emerged from the thick clump of reeds and seen it. It had been so easy. Because there was no threat anymore. Before them lay the Midgar Zalem, the dreaded serpent that lived in the marshes. It was as Choco Bill had said, a serpent about fifteen foot high. The Zalem was upright, to a point, with its heart pierced on the top of a large, ten-foot stick embedded in the earth. Its head hung limp behind it, its mouth wide open to reveal its awful teeth, a pool of blood around it. More blood trickled down its body where the stick had pierced it, and also ran down the stick towards the ground. Now they could understand why the Chocobos in the Choco Plains were so timid, they had sensed death approaching. Cloud climbed off the Chocobo's back, and walked slowly towards the Midgar Zalem. The Chocobo was incredibly anxious and twitchy at being so close to the Zalem, even if it was dead. As Cloud neared the stick he pulled off one of his gloves and softly touched the blood that was still riding down the stick, although it was slowing down now. The blood was still warm on his fingers. Did Sephiroth do this? He asked aloud, looking up once again at the terrifying corpse of the snake. Amazing! Tifa gasped in awe. She had never seen anything like it, a beast as large and as feared as the Midgar Zalem had been taken down by just one person. Then, Sephiroth was not an ordinary person. Our enemy is someone that could do this. Eris asked, her face pale. That Sephiroth guy's pretty strong, I'd say, said Barrett. A sudden wave of nausea hit her and she quickly slid off the Chocobo's back. She ran a few feet away and fell to her knees, pressing her face close to the earth against the beautiful, living stalks of grass. She inhaled deeply, inhaling the energizing scent of something alive and away from the sickening stench of blood. She opened her eyes as she felt something nuzzling against her, and she looked up to see Red Thirteen's face close to hers. He looked at Eris through his soft, gentle eyes. The look of those eyes made a small smile appear on Eris's face. She put her arms gently around Red Thirteen's neck and felt the warmth of his fur against her skin. When she was done she released Red Thirteen and nodded her head, and stood up. It's a power that we should respect. Red Thirteen said. Barrett and Tifa climbed off the Chocobos and released them. The two Chocobos instantly turned and fled from the Zalem's corpse and into the marshes, heading back towards their home ground like Choco Billy had told them. A cave was built into the side of the mountain close to the Midgar Zalem's corpse. They moved as a group past the bleeding body, and Eris tried hard not to look at its frozen open eyes as she walked past. 
she walked quickly past it and stayed close to Tifa and Cloud, until they had passed safely through the open hole and into the mithril mines. Mithril Mine Before the use of Mako energy came into fruition, the only energy source that was available was that of mithril, dug up from mines within mountains like the one they were going through right then. Every wall, path, and ledge had once been heavily loaded with mithril, but now many of the walls were just plain old rock now. There were still some traces of mithril left in small pits, but other than that it had been dug dry of all mithril. Now many of the mithril mines were abandoned. Everything had been replaced by the apparently abundant Mako energy. Most of the monsters hiding in that cave were nocturnal, but there were a few that weren't. In particular there was a very peculiar species that looked kind of like a crab, crawling across the walls of the mines and looking down at Cloud and his group with hungry eyes. Yet they dared not approach a group so large. It was a very solemn silence that ran between them as they walked on through the mines. The only sounds came from the echo of their footsteps, or the echo of monster feet tapping against the walls as they watched the group pass through. Their minds were trailing back to the death of the Shinra president and many of the people in the Shinra building, and then to the death of the Midgar Zalem. Both were horrific murders unlike anything they had ever seen, and it was just a small piece of Sephiroth's extended power. They moved on to the last part of the mine, where a large tree had grown inside, much to their surprise. Its roots were growing all over the place, thick but spread out, winding around the rocks and even bursting through the walls. They were all so silent they hardly even noticed the sound of footsteps heading their way from the ledge above, or the shadow that stopped over them. Just a second. Came a voice. The group stopped and looked up towards the base of the tree, which was positioned on the ledge above by the exit of the mine. Sunlight was shining in from the exit and highlighting the silhouette of Root as he stood on the edge of the ledge, looking down at them. Eris looked up. By any chance, are you? She asked unable to see Rude clearly. Do you know who I am? Rude asked. He was still wearing his shades, even in the shadows of the mine. From the Turks, right? Asked Cloud. Rude nodded, seeming impressed that they recognized the Turks when they saw them. Well, if you know, then this won't take long, he said, folding his arms superiorly. It's difficult to explain what the Turks do. Cloud also crossed his arms. Kidnapping, right? Rude looked down at him silently. To put it negatively? He said finally, and almost quite somberly. You could say that. But, that's not all there is to it anymore. He seemed about to say something else, but he suddenly stopped and turned aside, falling silent once again. The others watched him curiously. He was very different to Reno. The Turks came in all shapes and sizes, they figured. Sir. Came a woman's voice. The group and Root all turned and looked up towards a higher ledge above them, where a woman was standing. It was clear from her appearance that she was also a Turk, she had the same blue uniform that Root, Reno and Tseng all wore. She had short blonde hair that was swept to one side, and a fierce, determined expression. It's all right, Root. The woman said formerly, standing firm on the rocks. I know you don't like speeches, so don't force it. Rude didn't even give a flicker of a smile. Then Elena, explain. The Turk known as Elena nodded and looked down at Cloud and his group. The way she stood made it clear that she was not very experienced and was trying to assert her authority over them, and not to much success either. I'm the newest member of the Turks, Elena, she said, introducing herself. Thanks to what you did to Reno, we're short of people. Although because of that, I got promoted to the Turks. In any case, our job is to find out where Sephiroth is headed. And try to stop you every step of the way. Wait a minute, it's the other way around. You're the ones that are getting in our way. She scratched her head and turned away, puzzled. Elena. You talk too much. Elena snapped round and looked down behind Rude, where Tseng walked up from the exit. A wave of red spread across Elena's face as she burned inside, her heart pounding in embarrassment. Mr. Tseng! She exclaimed. Tseng stopped beside Rude and gently pushed his black hair away from his eyes, looking up at the blushing Elena. No need to tell them about our orders, he told her simply and unemotionally. Still, Elena continued to blush. Sorry. Tseng. Tseng slowly nodded his head. I thought I gave you other orders, he said to her. 
Elena looked away for a second, the red glow in her cheeks growing ever stronger, and trembled a little. Feng sighed and shook his head pitifully, before signaling for her to go. Now go! He ordered. Don't forget to file your report. Oh! Right! The young Turk exclaimed. She turned back towards Root and Seng and saluted formally. Very well, Root and I will go after Sephiroth, who's heading for Janan Harbor. In Cloud's group, Tifa and Eris giggled slightly at the Turk's mistake. Elena looked at them in bewilderment, wondering what she had said to make them giggle so. She was about to snap at them to shut their mouths, when she saw Root slowly shaking his head and Seng looking at the floor, holding his head in his hands. Elena, Seng whispered sadly. You don't seem to understand. Elena blinked, clearly still confused. With a flash she remembered her exact words, and her face burned once again. Oh! She exclaimed, shifting uncomfortably on the rock she was standing on. I'm, I'm sorry. Go! Oh. Don't let Sephiroth get away! Yes, sir! Said Elena and Rude together. Elena then turned and ran back through the cave she had come from, desperate to get away before her face literally burst into flames from the embarrassment of messing up in front of her own boss. Rude was about to leave when he stopped as though he had remembered something, and turned back to Cloud and his group. Reno said he wanted to see you after the injuries you gave him healed, he said, looking specifically at Cloud as he spoke. He wanted to show his affection for you all. With a new weapon. He then turned and nodded to Tseng. Tseng nodded back and Rude ran out of the exit. Once he was gone, Feng stepped up to the edge and looked down at them. Well, then... He began. He stopped suddenly as he saw Eris standing between Cloud and Tifa. For a moment there was a flicker of softness in his eyes, which he quickly pushed away. Eris! Long time no see. Looks like you got away from the Shinra for a while, now that Sephiroth reappeared. Eris narrowed her green eyes fiercely. So what are you saying? She asked of him, sounding angry. That I should be grateful to Sephiroth. No. Tseng replied, his own voice sounding a little sad at Ares's anger. Well, I won't be seeing too much of you, so take care. Ares tilted her head to the side. Strange, hearing that from you. Tseng turned away from them and headed towards the door, hiding the look he had on his face. He then stopped again. Well then, stay out of Shinra's way, he said instead. Before Eris could say anything else he quickly walked on and out of the mine, leaving Cloud's team alone in its dark corridors. Eris looked down at the ground and shuffled her feet. By the time they finally left the Mithril mines there was no sign of the Turks, although there were the tracks of a vehicle outside the exit, heading off away from the mine and winding around the Condor Plains into the distance. This was a time when they wished they could have kept the Chocobos, but there was no way they would have got the Chocobos through those caves. They continued to move on as a group across the Condor Plains, this time a little chirpier now they had left the dank, dreariness of the abandoned mine behind and were walking through the sunlight. Thanks to Elena's naivety and inexperience with the Turks, she had accidentally given away their next location. Cloud had somewhat expected that Sephiroth would be heading to Janon, it was the only place on the continent that allowed transport to the other continent. So it was clear that Sephiroth was planning to go across the ocean, and Cloud would follow him every step of the way. It was easier to take the direct route to Janon, going in pretty much a straight line towards the shore, and passing through a nearby forest towards the final stretch that led to the port town of Janon. They had to be careful as they walked through the winding paths through the forest, it was not a large forest, but kappa wires and formulas, vicious plant and bird beasts that were no strangers to attacking unwary travelers inhabited it. The problem lay mainly with the kappa wires, they looked so much like ordinary plants it was almost impossible to distinguish them from the rest of the forest wildlife. Yet, as it turned out, it was neither the kappa wires nor the formula birds that they had to be wary of. As they continued to walk through the forest, they were completely unaware of something stalking them, following them cautiously through the treetops. It trailed them throughout the forest, a sly shadow preparing to strike. It was Red 13 who noticed it first. His keen hearing caught the sound of shuffling amongst the treetops, something that was not the sound of the wind blowing through the trees. He stopped suddenly and fell silent, his body not moving at all, and his ears twitching gently round to focus solely on the sound. The stalker froze, poised on a branch above him. The stalker held his breath, trying not to make a sound that would give him away. Then, very cautiously, he slowly backed off into the shadows of the leaves, and out of sight. What is it? Cloud asked suddenly, breaking the silence. 
everyone stopped and turned to Red 13. Red 13 continued to look around the treetops, his sharp eyes focusing on the movement of every leaf on every branch. He sniffed at the air and sure enough, there was a scent in the air that did not belong to any monster. We're being followed, he said in reply. With a sudden bust of speed Red 13 spun round and dashed off into the trees and out of sight. Cloud and the others stayed where they were, confused. They too began to look around, but they could not hear, see, or smell anything rather than the fragrance of the forest. They couldn't even hear Red 13 now, and the silence was extremely uncomfortable. Moments later a piercing scream rang through the forest and everyone turned sharply to the bushes nearby. They rustled loudly before suddenly parting, and someone ran out. It was a girl no more than 16 years old, and was dressed in an outfit that none of them had ever seen before. She looked like some sort of ninja or warrior, dressed in a tight green sleeveless top that stopped just on the diaphragm, and a pair of thick white shorts that were perfect for running in. Her left arm was protected by a long white panel that was used as a shield, attached to her body by hooks around the palm of her hand and a piece of armor attached to her shoulder. Her other arm was encased in a band rising up to her upper arm, and an armlet around her wrist. On her feet were boots with straps attaching them to her shorts. Her hair was short and dark brown, with a band tied around her forehead and two long strips resting down her back. What was most amazing about her was her weapon. It was a four-point shuriken, a ninja's weapon. It was a deadly weapon when in the hands of the skilled, and from the looks of her she probably was. Moments after the girl came tumbling out of the forest, Red 13 came dashing out. The girl jumped back in a fright, gripping her shuriken tightly in her hands. Red 13 looked up at her and snarled fiercely. Hey! Back off, you stupid mutt! The girl snapped, waving her shuriken in front of her in an attempt to keep Red 13 from getting closer to her. This girl's been following us ever since we entered the forest. Red 13 growled. Everyone turned and looked at the girl with interest. She was really no more than a child, and couldn't see any sense in her wandering around the forest by herself. She was clearly not from this continent, that much was certain. The way she dressed and her strong, aggressive accent gave that away. The girl looked around and, seeing that she was surrounded, quickly spun round and made a dash for the trees. She zipped past Tifa as she ran, quickly reaching out to the girl before pulling away again and making a break again for the trees. Before she could get away Barrett quickly grabbed her, picking her up with one arm and using his other arm to hold her still. The girl struggled, but Barrett was far stronger. Hey! Let me go! Tifa checked herself over. She glanced over at her armlet, and saw the empty spot where her piece of fire materia had once been. She stole my materia! Tifa exclaimed, showing Cloud her empty armlet. The little thief stole it. I am not a thief. The girl protested fiercely. I didn't steal anything. You probably just dropped it when you were walking. Now let go of me, before I get mad. Cloud narrowed his eyes. A materia hunter, hey. Barrett tightened his grip on the girl's arms. She struggled harder, but the pain was too much to bear and she was forced to open up her hands. Her shuriken dropped harmlessly onto the forest floor, along with the green ball of materia. Cloud walked over and picked it up, holding it in front of the girl's face. I think this belongs to us, he said. The girl froze, realizing that she had been caught out. She looked into Cloud's eyes before looking away, quickly thinking about her situation. Eventually, she looked up again. All right, so maybe I did steal it, she admitted. But you should keep a tighter grip on your possessions. It's not my fault if they happen to slip into my hands. Cloud turned away from the girl and threw the materia back to Tifa, who placed it back in her armlet, giving the girl a fierce glare as she did so. The young girl sighed. Okay, you got your materia back, she said. She tilted her head back and glared up at Barrett. Now, let me go, you big dope. You're hurting me. Barrett looked over to Cloud, who nodded. He then threw the girl down onto the ground, and she rolled over onto her knees. She stayed there for a second, before she suddenly began to chuckle. Her chuckle got louder until it attracted the attention of the group. She slowly turned to them, still on the floor, a wide grin on her face. One thing you should always remember, she said, is never let go of the Materia Hunter. She suddenly zipped up and darted forward, incredibly fast. Barrett didn't even have time to dodge as she ran past, snatching the materia from his gun arm as she passed and ran off into the forest, laughing as she did so. The group all jumped in surprise, and began to chase after her. 
she was incredibly fast as she dashed through the forest, zipping through the bushes and dodging the trees. She could possibly even beat Red 13 in a race, and as she knew every inch of the forest, she had the advantage over her pursuers. With her shuriken in her hand she cut away the overhanging branches and bushes that blocked her path. That was her only mistake, she was giving them a trail to follow. Cloud pulled ahead of the others as they tore through the forest after the girl, but even he was not fast enough to catch up to her. She was already well away from them, and fatigue was beginning to take its hold on Cloud and slow him down. Eventually he was forced to stop, but he wasn't prepared to let the girl escape yet. Quickly drawing his sword he flipped the blade over and pulled out the red materia he received from the Chocobos at Chocobo Farm. Closing his eyes he concentrated until the materia began to glow, and then he threw the ball forward into the forest. The materia flew through the air, and a bright wave of light burst from its center. The light flashed through the trees, and the materia disappeared. Then from the light emerged a silhouetted figure, tearing out of the light and into the forest. This was the effect of summon materia, calling forth a beast within. Not that this was a beast, and it was easy to see why the chocobos were attracted to it. The materia released the energy of a chocobo, which began to dash through the forest after the thief. Riding on the chocobo's back was a muggle, ushering the bird on. The girl glanced back and saw the choco slash mock heading towards her. She cried out in fright, and pushed herself harder. She may have been a fast runner, but she was not fast enough to outrun a chocobo. The chocobo and its muggle owner tore after her until it was just a few feet behind her. The chocobo lurched its head forward and grabbed onto the rim of the girl's shorts. She fell off her feet instantly as the chocobo lifted her up and began to carry her back towards Cloud. The chocobo dropped her easily at Cloud's feet, and then vanished and returned to its original materia state. Cloud caught the ball and put it back on his sword, before walking up to the girl. As he approached her she suddenly jumped to her feet and swung her shuriken in an attempt to cut Cloud's head off. Cloud pulled away and pulled his sword up in front of his face, blocking the shuriken off. The others finally caught up to see Cloud and the young girl engaged in the middle of a fierce test of strength, trying to outweat one another and who would miss the strike first. The girl swiped her shuriken towards Cloud's head again, and once again Cloud blocked it with his blade. The edges of the shuriken became jammed with the handle of Cloud's sword, and she couldn't pull it away. She struggled and pulled hard, but it wouldn't budge. Realizing this, Cloud quickly flicked his sword up. The shuriken fell from the girl's hands and through the air, landing safely on the ground a few meters away. The girl fell backwards onto the ground, defeated. Cloud panted heavily and leaned over to pick up the ball of materia that had also fallen from the girl's hands along with her weapon. He kept his sword aimed at her in case she made any other attempts to run away, but from the defeated look on her face it was clear she wasn't going to. He then withdrew his sword and put it back where it belonged. She was talented, that was clear. She turned away, sulking. The others then began to walk up to them, and Cloud threw the materia to Barrett. Cloud, do you know her? Tifa asked. Who is that girl? Wondered Eris. Cloud walked back to the girl, who was now sat with her back to them. Man. She said quietly to herself as he approached. I can't believe I lost. She shook her head and climbed to her feet, brushing the dirt and soil off her clothes. She suddenly leaped up over a meter into the air and flipped over Cloud, landing daintily on the ground behind him, an angry look on her face. You spiky-headed jerk! She yelled at him. One more time, let's go one more time. Cloud shook his head in reply. Not interested, he said. He had had pretty much enough chasing this girl. Still, he couldn't help but wonder. Thinking of running away? She asked him sarcastically. Even without her shuriken, she raised her fists and began to punch the air furiously, so fast it was hard to see her fists move. Stay and fight! She ran to Cloud and punched, but he stepped back away from her. Fight, I said. She snapped. Come on. What's the matter? You're pretty scared of me, hey? Cloud rolled his eyes. Petrified. At his reply the girl jumped up again and landed behind Cloud again, perched on a nearby rock so she stood almost as tall as him. Hmm, just as I thought. What do you expect with my skills? She said smugly. She was acting as though she had never even lost. She gave them a little wave. Good luck to you guys, too. If you feel up to it, we can go another round. Later. She jumped off the rock and began to run back towards the forest. Before she left the small clearing, she stopped and looked back at Cloud. 
I'm really gonna leave. Really. Cloud glanced around at the others, wanting their opinion. Eris was nodding her head at him even as he turned. Tifa and Red, 13 both seemed a little unsure, but eventually they agreed. Barrett looked around and saw the three of them nodding. He then quickly shook his head fiercely, not trusting the young girl one bit. But he was outnumbered, so Cloud turned back to the girl. Wait a second. He called out to her. What is it, you still have something for me? The girl asked him. In truth, she was expecting him to stop her from running, if not hoping that he would. She turned back and walked slowly towards the group. Hmm. So is that it? I know you want my help because I'm so good. You want me to go with you. That's right, said Cloud. He prayed it was the right decision. Behind him, Barrett sagged in dismay. A smile spread on the girl's face, her inner ego rising. Ha, ha. Thought so, she said. She turned away and began to pace back and forth across the floor, pretending to be making a decision. Cloud rolled his eyes again. You put me in a spot. Hmm, what should I do? But if you want me that bad, I can't refuse. She clapped her hands together and turned back to them, smiling. All right. She announced. I'll go with you. The others all sighed heavily. Finally. Let's hurry on, Cloud said to everyone, and they all turned and began to walk off through the forest, past the girl and leaving her behind. She stared in astonishment. Hey. 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 Wait. She called. She ran across the ground and picked up her shuriken, and turned back to the others. I haven't even told you my name. I'm Yuffie. Good to meet Cha. She waited until the others were all out of earshot, before she turned away from them and began to rub her hands together gleefully. A sly smile spread on her face. Ha, ha. She laughed quietly to herself. Just as I planned. Now all I have to do is... A little this. And a little that. Nyuk, nyuk, nyuk. She suddenly looked up around her, realizing that she was alone. Hey, wait up. Wait for me. She called, beginning to run back after the group. End of chapter. Episode 33, Part 03, Chapter 33. Chapter 33. Following their rather strange encounter with the materia hunter known as Yuffie Kisaragi, the group of six headed on towards the port town of Junon in the far west of the continent. Back in the days before the Shinra and the use of Mako energy, Junon had been a busy port town filled with fishermen, traders, merchants, and all kinds of travelers journeying to and from the continent. The port joined up with its partner port of Costa del Sol on the shores of the western continent, a popular holiday place. Once upon a time ships would be constantly moving in and out of the port's docks. That was until the Shinra moved in. Junon was now a completely different place, nothing like it used to be. There were very few people living in Junon now that weren't from the Shinra, and the once happy, light, and busy streets of Junon were now dark, desolate and lonely. There were only a few people wandering around, and they were elderly people who were unable to afford to move. The young people had all left for a better place to live. That wasn't the only thing that had changed. The port town of Junon had now become a two-layered city. The actual port of Junon lay at the bottom, and the larger city built up against the mountain was above it, built by the Shinra to house their ever-expanding empire. The larger city, built entirely of metal, overshadowed the small port and practically blocked off most of the sunlight, hence the darkness that swamped it. The only to the upper part of Junon lay in a lift that was built at the far end of the town. However the Shin regarded that, so getting up there was not going to be an easy task. Cloud and his friends, and their new friend, Yuffie, all stood in the entrance of the town and looked around. The town was so empty and lonely, most of the shops were boarded up, with many others ready to give up as well. Most of the business now was in the upper city. It reminded them a little of Midgar. The port of Junon had become the slums to the greater upper city of Junon. What happened to this town? Cloud asked, greatly saddened to see the great port reduced to a lonely slum. It's so run down. Their presence attracted the attention of a nearby woman who was just coming out of her house to go to one of the few remaining shops. Like many of the remaining citizens of this town, she was elderly and was forced to walk slowly, not that anyone in Shinra would have cared. The people of Shinra had almost forgotten the people in Lower Janon, and only posted a guard at the lift to keep them separate. 
as the woman came out she looked at them, and blinked in surprise. Well, now this is rare, she said, her voice old and croaking. She wandered slowly over to them. We almost never have anyone other than the Shinra people visit this town. She eyed them over, looking at them closely through her old, aged eyes, and slowly nodded her head. I know you guys want to get to the western continent, but the only way is on a Shinra ship. That was enough to put the group down. Not only did Shinra control the town, but they also controlled the ships traveling to and from Janan as well. And since Shinra was on a constant lookout for Cloud and his group, as well as Sephiroth, getting on board a ship was not going to be easy either. They left the old woman to her muttering and headed deeper into the town, and looked around at what few people remained in the town. All of the tradesmen and businessmen had packed up and left long ago, and there weren't many fishermen left. Thanks to the Mako reactor that had been built close to Janon, the ocean water surrounding the town had become very polluted, there were hardly any fish left. In order for the fishermen to catch their fish they had to go further out into the ocean, something that was very dangerous these days. Separating from the group a little bit, Tifa walked on and stood by the old stone wall that bordered the once popular shores from the rest of the port. She frowned as she saw the water. It was slightly dirty, but she knew that beneath the water it would be even more polluted. A large electric tower positioned in the water, rising all the way up to the city above, also spoiled the sight. She looked up and was instantly reminded of Midgar, the large plates blocking her view of the sunlight. Hey! Mr. Dolphin! Came a young female voice. Tifa looked down in surprise to see a young girl about seven or eight years old standing on the shore. She was dressed in a swimsuit and had a pair of armbands clamped tightly around her arms. As Tifa watched the water close to the shore rippled, and to her complete astonishment a small blue head popped out. It was the head of a dolphin. A dolphin, so close to the polluted shores of Janon. The girl smiled and waved happily at the dolphin, before cupping her hands around her mouth to amplify her voice. My name is... P-R-I-S-L-L-A. She shouted out to the swimming dolphin. Now you say it. The dolphin made its playful sounds in reply, before diving through the air and splashing in the water again. Priscilla turned to see Tifa walk slowly down the steps towards her, her eyes wide in awe at the sight of the beautiful dolphin. Cloud and Eris were walking close behind her, while the others watched silently at the top of the shore. Apart from Yuffie, that is, who was already busy scavenging the city for any materia that she could swipe. Who are you guys? Priscilla demanded, placing her hands on her hips indignantly. Are you members of the Shinra, Inc? The sudden hostility to her voice made the three stop in surprise. No. Replied Tifa calmly. Stay calm. That's how it is, said Cloud. Priscilla's eyes flashed fiercely, the anger and hatred showing plainly on her tanned little face. I don't believe you. She snapped, stamping her foot against the sandy floor. Get out of here! Cloud held his head. Great! He groaned. That was all they needed. It was clear that the Shinra were hated in Janon as much as Midgar. Not that he could blame them. The Shinra weren't exactly popular anywhere. What's that? cried Eris suddenly. Everyone turned to the shore where Eris was pointing, just in time to see the water around the beach begin to ripple towards them. The rippling formed into a small wave that crashed down onto the beach, going up close to the spot where Priscilla was standing. Beneath the surface of the water they could see a large shadow skulking around the electric tower. As they watched, the shadow abruptly rose up out of the water and revealed itself. It was an enormous sea serpent, with silky scales so smooth the water slid off easily down its long, thin frame. Its face was long and pointed, with a mouth filled with many sharp teeth shaped specifically like a razor, or like a pterodactyl's teeth. It had large fins on the side of its cylindrical body, spraying water into the air as they flapped back and forth. The dolphin was still swimming around in the water then, swimming very close to where the sea serpent had arisen. As the playful dolphin saw the serpent its entire blue body convulsed in fear, and he quickly dived down beneath the surface, moving its tail rapidly to swim off before it was caught. The serpent saw the flash of movement from the dolphin, and snapped its head round towards it. Be careful, Mr. Dolphin! Priscilla cried. She ran down the beach towards the water's edge and dived fearlessly into the water. She rose to the surface and began to swim towards the dolphin, determined to save her water-bound friend. The serpent saw her coming and sank down beneath the surface of the water. Priscilla stopped and looked around, wondering where the serpent had gone. Seconds later a huge shadow appeared beneath her, but she had no time to move. 
the water around her exploded into the air as the serpent burst up from beneath the surface, carrying Priscilla with it. The girl fell through the air, falling away from the serpent and back towards the water. She landed back in the water with an almighty splash, sinking straight to the bottom as the suction from the serpent caught her up. Her head banged hard on a rock lying at the bottom of the water, and from that moment on she lay limp, floating silently on the ocean floor. Hey! Cloud called out, seeing Priscilla sink. Hold on, we're coming. Quickly, he unhooked his sword and threw it down onto the floor, along with the armor he had on his shoulder. Then, without waiting for anyone to protest, he ran forward and dived headfirst into the swirling water, swimming down to save the girl before she drowned. Cloud! No! cried Tifa. She made to run to the water after him, but the serpent raised its tail and slammed it down into the water in front of her. It raised its head and screeched loudly, making the very water shake with its cry. It then turned to Tifa and began to lunge at her, its mouth wide open to reveal the sharp razor-like teeth that would cut her to shreds. A bright blaze of white flashed through the air, and the sea serpent quickly withdrew. An icy casing formed over its head, freezing its jaw solid so they couldn't move. Tifa spun round to see Barrett tearing down the stairs towards her, and she smiled. The sea serpent struggled violently for a second as the ice around its face began to crack and shatter, until it broke free and lifted its head high, screeching loudly. It didn't have time to retaliate, four seconds later a blast of fire suddenly rose up and smashed it right in the face. The serpent screeched again in pain as clouds of smoke and steam slowly rose into the air around its face, its scaly face burned by the flames of Tifa's magic. Down beneath the surface of the water, Cloud swam down towards the ocean bed, surprised at how deep the water had become because of the serpent's arrival. He eventually found Priscilla a few feet below him, her body limp and her eyes closed. Normally, she would have floated back up to the surface because of her armbands, but a long length of watery reeds growing from the ocean floor had tied themselves around her ankle, preventing her from going anywhere. Quickly Cloud swam to her, pulling her around to face him. She was unconscious and losing air fast. He moved down and tugged hard on the reed entangled around her ankle. It was as tight as anything, and was so slippery in the water it was hard to get a decent grip on it. Cloud refused to give up and pulled hard. A loud explosion rippled through the water above him, and he spared a glance upwards. A fiery red glow was shining through the surface of the water, and he could faintly hear the agonized, warbled cry of the sea serpent as it cried out again, before a flash of movement signaled to him that it had lunged again. He shook his head and turned back to Priscilla. He had to get her out soon. The serpent snapped its jaws angrily, lunging towards the beach again with intense ferocity. Tifa and Eris dived apart from where they stood as the serpent's head slammed into the sand between them. Red 13 took that time to lunge at the creature's head and clutched on. The creature's skin was so thick and much harder than he expected, so he wasn't able to get a strong grip. It was strong enough for him to hold on as the serpent rose upright again, and Red 13 thrust his head down at the serpent's green eyes. There was a loud cry and a spurt of watery green blood as Red 13's teeth tore through the soft flesh of one of its eyes. In agony the monster thrashed its head, throwing Red 13 off in the process. He flew through the air and crashed back onto the beach, rolling across the sand until he slammed into the far wall. Look out! Eris cried again. Everyone turned as the sea serpent spun around in the water, lifting its tail up out of the water and flicking it out towards them. The group all jumped back out of its way, but Eris was not able to move fast enough. The long, vine-like tail of the serpent wrapped around her waist and flung her to the floor, before dragging her back and into the water, pulling her under and out of sight. Eris! yelled Tifa. Cloud finally snapped the reed in half and pulled Priscilla free, pulling her close to him as he began to swim back towards the surface, desperate for air. He felt the loud thud of the serpent's tail landing back in the water, and opened his eyes wide in horror as he saw Eris flash past him, entwined in the monster's tail, before she disappeared to the surface again. Quickly Cloud swam back to the surface, carrying Priscilla with him. They broke the surface of the water and Cloud gasped for air, before looking around for Eris. He saw her just a few meters above him, the serpent's tail still holding her by her waist above the water. He couldn't reach her. The serpent screeched again, preparing to lunge another attack at his friends on the beach. H-Y-A-H A swift figure tore down the steps onto the beach and zipped across the sand, kicking it up behind her as she ran. Barrett didn't have time to turn as Yuffie ran up behind him, nor react as she leaped up onto his back and jumped off, propelling herself up into the air. She pulled out her shuriken as she flew up, its four metal points flashing in the light. 
she brought the shuriken down hard as she neared the sea serpent's head, and the monster cried out as one of its four points landed squarely in its forehead. Yuffie used this connection as a hook as she brought her feet down firmly on the creature, before pulling the shuriken down to cut a long, deep gash in the monster's head. In response the monster thrashed and screeched, more blood beginning to trickle from its face. It snapped upwards, trying to bite the attacking ninja. Yuffie was already gone, however. She leaped from the serpent's head and back into the air, falling down towards the monster's tail where Eris was still being held. Another flick from her shuriken saw to that problem as the end of the monster's tail was cut clean off, releasing Eris and dropping her towards the ocean, along with the tail piece. Cloud immediately began to swim to her, still with Priscilla in his arms. Eris threw her arms around him as he neared her, and together they began to swim back to the shore. Her job complete, Yuffie jumped from the monster's tail and onto its thrashing fin, making one final jump back to the shore. The sea serpent was splashing angrily in the water, one too many wounds making it screech in pain. It eventually gave up its fight and turned away, diving back into the water and swimming away from the port to lick its painful wounds. Tifa immediately ran to the water's edge in time to help Cloud, Eris, and Priscilla out of the water. Eris was fine, if a little shaken, but Priscilla was not so good. They dragged her up away from the water and lay her down on the sand. Her dark hair was strewn over her face, but she wasn't making any sign of movement at all. This is bad. Cloud said as they all gathered around the unconscious girl. You don't think she's dead, do you? Priscilla. They looked up to see an old man standing on the top of the stairs. As he saw Priscilla lying there on the sand, motionless, he ran as quickly as his old body could carry him to get to her, pushing Cloud and Eris aside to be close to her. They watched as he leaned over and put his face close to her mouth, trying to feel her breath against his cheek. He shook his head, his eyes dimming. Nope. She's not breathing. He said sadly. He sagged for a second, before his eyes suddenly lit up and he spun around to Cloud. Young man, CPR, now. Cloud jumped back in surprise, his blue eyes narrowing in fright. Mouth to mouth. He demanded. He couldn't believe what he was hearing. Cloud, what are you going to do? Tifa demanded of him angrily. But... She's just a girl. Cloud, hurry. Eris urged him. Cloud looked down at the ground, unsure. He knew he was the best person to give CPR. He was strong enough, after all, but... She was a child, he couldn't bring himself to do that. Besides, he didn't really know how, he'd never have to give CPR before. That confusion showed clearly in his face, and the old man stared at him. What? You don't know how? He asked. Come over here, I'll show you. He moved aside just out of earshot of the others, and motioned for Cloud to come over. Cloud looked around at the urging looks of Tifa and the others, before he sagged. Guess I gotta do it. He agreed finally, and went over to the old man, who pulled him round to face him. Just take a deep breath. Hold it in, the old man explained to him, using hand actions to show what he meant and how much air to take in. Then breathe into her. He ran behind Cloud and gave him a harsh push. Hurry up and do it. Cloud went back over to Priscilla and looked down at her. He knew he had to do it, she was going to die if he didn't. Kneeling down beside her he carefully pushed her hair away from her face, and gently tilted her head back to clear her airway. Pinching her nose closed with one hand, Cloud opened her mouth and took a deep breath before placing his mouth firmly over hers and breathing into her. He could see her lungs rising as he breathed into her, air filling them. He pulled away from her and looked down. Nothing was happening, Priscilla was still unconscious. He looked around at the hopeful faces of the others and the old man. Eris was holding onto the young girl's hand, looking down at her with a look of fear in her eyes. She suddenly looked up at Cloud, the fear in her eyes turning to desperation. Cloud nodded slowly, before he went down pinched her nose again and breathed deeply into her once more. Yet with each breath he gave her, Priscilla gave no signs of movement, and it didn't look like she was going to. Then, as Cloud breathed into her for the tenth time, he felt something gurgle from within Priscilla's throat, and he quickly pulled away. Eris's eyes lit up as the young girl shuddered slightly and coughed, coughing up water that had been lying in her lungs. She then gasped for air, her throat coarse and sore. Ugh. Ugh. She spluttered. The old man was by her side in a flash, politely pushing Eris away so he could be beside her. Hey, hey. Priscilla, are you alright? He said. 
Priscilla moaned slightly, and the man sighed heavily in relief. He picked her up gently in his arms and began to carry her off back into the town, to get her inside and warmed up before she caught pneumonia and got even more ill. Cloud sighed heavily, feeling a little breathless after all that. He was relieved Priscilla was all right, but she wasn't completely out of danger just yet. Even so Tifa patted him on the arm, pleased that her childhood friend had just saved a young child's life. There was no reason for them to stay on the shore any longer, so the group headed back into town. Cloud and Eris were still dripping after being in the water, and by now they were both beginning to feel a little cold. A few people had gathered in the doorways of their houses, smiling at them and congratulating them on the success of their fight. Yuffie, of course, was living up this moment of fame as she ran around from house to house, explaining to everyone how she had defeated the serpent. The way she explained it made it seem that she had been the only one in the fight, and everyone else was just a hindrance to her superior talent and skill. Barrett cocked his gun fiercely, aiming at Yuffie from across the town. Just one shot and I can shut that damn mouth of hers. He growled. Cloud watched him and sighed inwardly, a little too tired to be bothered with Barrett's rants right then. Tifa saw the look on Cloud's face and quickly interrupted Barrett. Leave it alone, Barrett, she said. I think we can handle her bragging this one time. She did actually save us. Barrett shook his fists angrily as he watched Yuffie showing off to the locals, but he eventually gave in and turned away to see the old woman they had spotted before heading towards them. Hey, the old woman said to them. Come in for a while. She turned and walked off, leaving Cloud and his group looking around aimlessly, wondering what she meant. The old woman stopped by the entrance to her house and opened the door, nodding for them to come in. The group did as they were told and entered the old woman's house. It was amazingly warm and cozy inside, seeming completely different from the run-down looks of the outside. The woman came in last, shutting the door behind her. I heard what happened, she said to them, walking over to the table where a pot of tea had just brewed. She poured two mugs and offered them to Cloud and Eris, who took them gladly. The warmth was so nice after the cold of the water, and it warmed them up nicely. You've done so much for Priscilla. You all must be tired. If you want to get some rest, stay here. She poured a few more mugs for Tifa, Barrett, and Red 13, before heading back to the door. There she stopped, and looked back at them with an old, kind smile. Make yourselves at home, she said, before leaving them. Once she was gone, Red 13 climbed up onto one of the stairs and sniffed at his mug of tea. It smelled so nice, shame he couldn't drink from a mug. That didn't stop him from trying though, as he flicked his tongue carefully inside the mug. So, what now? Asked Barrett, who was not at all interested in drinking tea just yet. Cloud shrugged. I'm not really sure, he replied, drinking more of the tea. We don't even know if Sephiroth is here, or if he's already left, pointed out Red 13. If he has, then we follow him, Cloud said, determined. But how? Asked Eris. The only way across is on a Shinra ship. Let's not think about this right now, said Tifa suddenly. She turned to Cloud. Take a rest. Cloud folded his arms and tapped his foot thoughtfully, rubbing the side of the cup gently. Eventually he nodded. Yeah. Let's rest. End of chapter. Episode 34, Part 03, Chapter 34 Chapter 34 Once all the tea was drunk and cups had been cleared, Cloud lay silently on the bed inside the old woman's house, slowly drifting off to sleep once the warmth of the tea had taken effect on him. The house itself was quite warm and his clothes were drying quickly, although they were still a little damp. He had heard the others talking before about ways to get to the upper city, but everyone was silent now. Even Yuffie had come back eventually, bored of her bragging. Cloud was thinking of nothing right then, and his mind was perfectly silent. That reminds me. Cloud jumped a little, opening his mind's eye before frowning. He knew the silence was too good to be true. You again? He asked, speaking to the blackness that surrounded him. Who are you? You'll find out soon. But more importantly, five years ago. Five years ago? Cloud said, thinking back. Nibelheim? When you went to Mount Nebel then, Tifa was your guide, right? Yeah. I was surprised. 
but where was Tifa other than that? Cloud closed his mind's eye for a moment, confused at the question. Where was Tifa other than as a guide? It didn't make any sense. He tried to think, running everything through in his mind, but he couldn't think of any time where Tifa could have been somewhere else. I don't know, he replied eventually. It was a great chance for you two to see each other again. You're right. Why couldn't you see each other alone? Cloud shook his head, feeling an overwhelming pressure beginning to build behind his eyes as he tried to remember, to fill in the blanks in his memory. I don't know, he said. He held his head as it began to pound from the pressure. I can't remember clearly. Why don't you try asking Tifa? Yeah. Then, get up. Hey, wake up. Wake up, Cloud. Cloud's eyes snapped open, but it was not the sound of Tifa's voice that had awoken him, but rather the silent command from the peculiar entity that kept speaking to him. He rolled over slightly and saw Tifa standing beside him, looking down at him with a slightly concerned look on her face. Cloud slowly sat up, his head still aching but the pounding easing off, and realized that he had kicked off most of the bed sheets. No wonder Tifa looked worried. She reached out to help him up but he stopped her, and stood up firmly, shaking his head as he did so. Also as he stood up, the sound of music began to ring in the background. It was faint, but loud enough to ring through the closed doors of the house. It was a form of parade music, but Cloud had other things on his mind right then. There was no one else in the house except them right then, so he was free to ask. Tifa? He said, looking up at Tifa through shaken blue eyes. When Sephiroth and I went to Nibelheim, where were you? Tifa tilted her head to the side, seeming confused. We saw each other, right? The other time? Tifa closed her eyes for a moment, thinking back, and Cloud waited patiently for her answer. A frown spread on her face, and she eventually shook her head, her brown hair swaying across her face. No. She said, and reopened her eyes. It was five years ago. I don't remember. She shook her head again, before changing the subject. But something seems strange outside. Cloud, come quick. With that she turned and fled for the door before Cloud could even think of stopping her. The moment she opened the door the sound of the music instantly became louder, and the two of them ran out into the streets of Lower Janon. Tifa was right, there was something very peculiar going on. The music that they could hear was not actually coming from the lower port of Janon, but rather from the upper city where the Shinra were based. A number of people were standing in the street looking up towards the upper city, but the majority of them had gathered around the main house in the middle of the town. Also standing there were Barrett and the others, waiting for Cloud and Tifa to run up. Yuffie was jumping from foot to foot, her hands clamped over her ears irritably. What's this loud music? She demanded. It's giving me a headache. Doesn't it seem a little strange? Tifa asked Cloud. Everything getting so noisy all of a sudden. Cloud nodded and looked up towards the upper city where the music was coming from. It was no use, he couldn't see anything. The large metal wall that was the site of the city made sure that nothing could be seen. Just then, all of the people surrounding the main house fell silent. He brought his gaze back down to Lower Janon. The door opened and out walked Priscilla, still dressed in her swimsuit but looking much better than before. Cloud walked up the steps leading up to the house and stopped near her. Are you all right now? He asked. Priscilla slowly nodded her head, her face blushing intensely as she looked back at Cloud with a shy smile. Um. Thanks for helping, she said sincerely. Cloud gave her a nod, and they both walked down towards the others waiting at the bottom. I'm sorry, I mistook you for one of those Shinra, Inc. She said. That's all right, Cloud said, waving his hand dismissively. Priscilla still looked a little embarrassed though, and looked down at the ground. Then she suddenly lifted her head and looked directly at Cloud, making him feel a little uneasy. I'll give you something special. She announced. She then delved into the pocket of her swimsuit and pulled out a small red ball, and the moment everyone set their eyes on it they stared in total surprise. It was materia, and not just any materia. It was summoned materia. Priscilla handed it to Cloud, who took it. It's an amulet. She said to him, the red burn still showing on her face. Take good care of it, okay? 
Cloud nodded and looked down at the red ball of materia in his hands. He wondered how Priscilla managed to get her hands on such a powerful form of materia, even though it was clear that she didn't know what it was. Inside the materia he could see the faint image of a female-like figure, shrouded in a very light blue aura. He vaguely remembered this materia, he had heard of it before. Shiva. He thought it was called. A maiden of pure ice. What's that music? Barrett asked the young girl. It sure sounds lively. Priscilla nodded her head. I heard they're rehearsing the reception for the new Shinra president, she told him. The moment she mentioned the Shinra the familiar sense of hostility appeared in her voice again, and her eyes flared up. Her dislike the Shinra was something she found very hard to control. Rufus! Barrett said, his rage matching Priscilla's as he raised his gun arm up to the sky, wishing it was aiming at Rufus's head. I gotta pay my respects. Priscilla walked past the group and looked out at the ocean. Grandpa and Grandma told me the speech was beautiful when they were small, she said, her voice calming a little. But after the Shinra built that city above, the sun stopped shining here, and the water got polluted. I was raised on that story and hate the Shinra so much, I could die. You think Rufus is thinking about crossing the ocean from here, too? Eris asked. What? Does that mean Sephiroth already crossed the ocean? Red 13 tilted his head and looked at Cloud. Cloud, didn't you finish Rufus off? Cloud shook his head. Unfortunately, he had never got the chance to finish Rufus off, because Rufus had fled before their battle could be concluded. Rufus, the son of the former President Shinra, now the new president and he was just as ruthless as his father was, if not even worse. Having Rufus and Janon made one thing certain, they were going in the right direction after Sephiroth, whether he had crossed the ocean or not. It also looked like they were also going to be trailing the Shinra every step of the way as well. He was so distracted in his own thoughts right then, he didn't notice the others all gathering around the wall bordering the beach. We gotta get to the town up there. Barrett was saying. He looked around and then pointed to the tower standing in the water, which rose to the upper city. Maybe we could climb the tower. No. No. Priscilla cried at him, running in front and waving her arms madly. There's a high voltage current running underneath the tower. Don't wander near it, it's dangerous. She then suddenly turned away and looked into the water. Moments later she clapped her hands excitedly and turned back. But. You might be able to if Mr. Dolphin helps you. Follow me. Priscilla then ran down the steps and onto the beach again, stopping by the water's edge and signaling for them all to follow her. One by one the others exchanged glances, none of them at all keen to go near the electrified tower and risk being electrocuted. Yet as they looked at each other the same thought crossed their minds, and slowly they all turned to look at Cloud still standing by Priscilla's house and thought. High voltage tower! Said Tifa, a slow smile spreading on her face as she looked at Cloud. I guess this means Cloud will be all right. Yeah, better leave it to Cloud, said Eris, nodding in agreement. At the mention of his name Cloud finally snapped out of his thoughts and looked at the others. They were all staring back at him, the same knowing and sly smiles on their face. Cloud blinked, but as he saw Priscilla on the shore, he figured out just what they were smiling about. We're counting on you, Cloud, Red 13 said. And before Cloud could even think about protesting, the group quickly separated and headed back into the town, passing Cloud and leaving him standing in front of the house on his own. Hey! Wait a second! Cloud called, but no one listened to him. He eventually gave in and sighed heavily, he knew better than to argue, because he wouldn't win. So he headed down the steps onto the beach, and went to Priscilla. Wait a minute, she told him. She turned away from him and put her hand in her pocket again, pulling out what looked like a long, shiny whistle. She put it to her mouth and gave it a quick, sharp blow, and it whistled loudly. At first nothing happened, but moments later the water in front of them began to ripple slightly as the shadow of the dolphin swam underneath it. Clearly it had not been hurt by the sea serpent from earlier. The dolphin then rose up and lifted its head out of the water, looking at Cloud and Priscilla with its usual, playful grin, before it dipped beneath the surface again. Then all of a sudden the dolphin dived up out of the water and up into the air. It rose a good ten meters up towards a metal bar that joined the tower to the side of the upper city wall, before falling down to the water again. He landed expertly with a loud splash, sending showers of spray into the air. Now ain't that something? came Barrett's voice. Cloud turned to see Barrett walking towards him across the beach. He stopped beside Cloud. I ain't never seen no dolphin jump like that. 
Priscilla nodded her head proudly. Pretty cool, hey? When I blow this whistle, Mr. Dolphin jumps for me. She skipped over to Cloud and held out the whistle, which was tied to a thin length of rope. Here. This is for you, Cloud. Cloud took the whistle and looked at it. A gift? He asked, confused. What am I supposed to do with it? Priscilla held her head in her hands and shook it pitifully. She then grabbed Cloud by his hand and pulled him towards, and then pushing him towards the water. Just go into the water, blow the whistle, and Mr. Dolphin will jump you to the top of the pole. She explained to him. Jump to the top of the pole. See that rod sticking out at the top? Said Priscilla, pointing up to the metal bar that hung above them. Cloud nodded. If you jump just right, you can climb to the top of the town. Good luck, Cloud. Said Barrett. If you make it, we'll follow you. He was about to turn away and head back to the others, when he suddenly remembered something. Whoa, I'll hold the PHS for you, he said. It'll break if it gets wet. Sure, said Cloud, unhooking the PHS from his belt and handing it to Barrett. He thought for a moment, before he also unhooked his sword and gave it to Barrett also. Barrett and Priscilla then stepped back and watched as Cloud headed into the water, getting his clothes wet for the second time that day. The dolphin swam over to him as he entered the water, swimming around him in a playful circle. Once it swam up really close and Cloud touched its sleek, rubbery skin. The dolphin chattered back at him, the large grin forever remaining on its long face. Cloud shook his head, before he blew sharply on the whistle Priscilla had given him. As he did the dolphin dipped beneath the water and out of sight. Cloud shook his head, waiting in the water, and looked up at the pole Priscilla had pointed out to him. He was almost directly beneath it. If he could get up there, it would be quite easy to climb to the top of the town, very easy. Yet he couldn't quite believe that the dolphin would be able to get him up there. Suddenly Cloud felt something push beneath him and lift him up out of the water for a second, before he dipped down again. Then, with a great big thrust the dolphin pushed up beneath Cloud and leaped into the air towards the pole, carrying Cloud with it. Cloud held onto the dolphin's fin tightly as he was carried all the way up into the air towards the pole. As they neared the pole, the dolphin bucked its body forward as it prepared to go back down to the water. Cloud quickly drew up his knees and pushed himself away from the dolphin, reaching out for the pole. He was close enough and wrapped his arms around the pole, holding on for dear life as the dolphin fell back down to the water. Cloud hung above the water, his legs dangling over the side of the pole. He held on tightly and began to pull himself up onto the bar, swinging his legs up onto the bar and clambering on top of it. The bar was just wide enough to hold him safely, and was securely attached to the tower. He waved down to Barrett and Priscilla to say he was all right, before he threw the whistle back down to Priscilla. She caught it easily and looked back at him. Cloud stood up carefully on the pole and began to walk across it to the electric tower. Now he was so high up away from the water he would be safe from the electric current flowing through it, but he would still have to be careful because high wire electric cables were everywhere. However the only way to the upper city was up the pylon, so Cloud had no choice but to climb the tower. He started off steadily up the side of the tower, constantly wary of the cables running around him. All it would take would be to touch the cables only slightly, and Cloud would be electrified into a frazzle. Barrett and Priscilla watched anxiously from the beach as he climbed. Priscilla clutched tightly onto her whistle and bit her lip, praying with all her heart that Cloud would be all right. After all, Cloud had saved her life. Cloud eventually reached the top of the electric pylon and came up alongside the high wall of the upper city. He peeked above the rim of the wall first, just to make sure there were no guards around, before he climbed up onto the platform and looked around. He found himself standing on the edge of a large landing field about the size of a football field. Standing about 20 meters ahead of him was an enormous airship, hovering slightly above the ground with its engine humming quietly on standby. The airfield was positioned slightly higher above the rest of the city, accessible only by taking the cargo platform lift up or down. Cloud was surprised that there were no guards around, but decided to use this to his advantage and headed quickly towards the cargo lift. He pressed down with his foot on the button to make the lift go down, and the lift headed down smoothly towards the buildings below. Again, there were no guards around guarding the entrances to any of the buildings, but even so Cloud headed cautiously towards the nearest building. By now the others would probably be making their way up the tower by now, if they hadn't found another way to the upper city. The new president's here. Hurriedly Cloud jumped back against the wall of the building he had just been about to walk into. He peered through the open doorway in time to see two Shinra soldiers, clad in their lily blue uniforms, running through the corridor. They ran past the door and turned the corner, 
heading through another door and out of sight. Cloud finally released his breath and entered the building. No he knew why there were so few guards around, they were all in a rush preparing for Rufus's welcoming ceremony. The door the two soldiers had run through probably led to the main part of the town. Hey! Came a voice. Cloud jumped and froze solid. After a moment or two he slowly turned his head to look behind him, and saw another Shinra soldier in a red uniform, a whistle in one hand, glaring at him fiercely. You still dress like that? The soldier snapped. Come here. Cloud stared, confused. The red soldier, who was clearly an officer in rank with his red uniform, ran over towards another door at the other end of the corridor, and kicked the door open with his boot. Here. Get into the room. For a second or two Cloud did nothing, quickly thinking over his situation. He was in Shinra territory, without a weapon, and the only materia he had was the Shiva materia Priscilla had given him. He would stand no chance going against the Shinra without his sword. Then an idea came to him. If he were going to get anywhere near to Sephiroth, he would have to get past the Shinra as well. If he could somehow walk amongst the Shinra as one of them, then there would be a greater chance of getting across the ocean. After all, he had worked for the Shinra, so he pretty much knew everything. So Cloud turned and nodded silently to the soldier, and followed him into the soldier changing rooms. As they entered the soldier gave Cloud a harsh push towards the lockers. Today's the big day when we welcome President Rufus. He announced. Hurry up and get changed. Cloud stopped by one of the lockers and glared back at the soldier, before he turned and opened one of the lockers beside him. Inside it was a blue soldier uniform, a uniform Cloud knew only too well. It looked just about his size, too. It's the Shinra uniform, Cloud muttered. He pulled it out and headed into the changing room out of view of the soldier, and began to put the uniform over the top of his usual clothes. Luckily it was his size and fitted easily over his clothes, even the armor over his shoulder. When he was almost done Cloud picked up the helmet and looked into the shadowed visor at his equally shadowed reflection. Brings back memories. He added with a sigh. Quit yappin'. Came the red soldier's impatient voice. Hurry up. Cloud shook his head pitifully and continued to look into the helmet visor. A Shinra uniform. He said, almost nostalgically. I was so proud when I first put it on. I wonder when it was. He shrugged and put the helmet on his head, pushing down the blonde spikes temporarily. He looked into the mirror at the hole of his reflection. I couldn't wearing this thing anymore, he finished. He pushed the visor down over his face, hiding his glowing eyes, and stepped out of the changing room, picking up a gun from the floor. The red soldier looked him up and down. Wow! You look good in it! He exclaimed. He nodded certainly, before he grew serious again. You remember the greeting procedure, right? Cloud shrugged. Of course he didn't know any greeting procedures. The soldier sighed. The look on your face says you forgot. All right, I'll show you again. Do just like we do. The door to the changing rooms burst open again, and the two blue soldiers Cloud had seen before suddenly ran back into the room. Commander! The two soldiers exclaimed. We'll help, too. This is how to do it. One of the soldiers said excitedly. We'll sing, too. The other one added. All right. Show em. Said the red soldier. Cloud tilted his head to the side, glad that the visor was hiding the expression that had sprung on his face. Sing? Whilst marching? Why? He couldn't figure it out at all, and was in such shock that he almost missed what happened next. Now march! The first blue soldier commanded. At his command, he and his fellow soldier began to march on the spot by the entrance of the changing room, keeping in perfect time with one another. This is the welcoming march. Then. I'll sing along with you. The other soldier added, again making Cloud's face turn pale and shocked. Yet the soldier didn't seem to care. Quietly. Aya. Aya. Hey, come on now. Now. Then the two soldiers began to sing and march at the same time, their voices even in time with the beats of their march. Unfortunately they needed one or two extra singing lessons and then some before what they were doing could be classed as singing. Cloud was sure even Barrett could sing better than that. He could hardly make out what they were saying, but he was sure he heard the words President Rufus in there at some point. Maybe. While the two soldiers were singing, the red soldier turned to Cloud. Keep in step with the soldier next to you and march smoothly. He explained to him. 
Once you're all in step, shoulder your gun. Got it. All clear. Replied Cloud. The soldier sighed with relief. Good. Make sure you do well at the parade. He was interrupted as the door opened yet again, and a third blue uniformed soldier ran into the room. Rufus has arrived. Preparation completed. He announced. The two soldiers stopped their march instantly and tore out of the room on the double, along with the third soldier. The red soldier nodded and turned again to Cloud. All right, showtime. He announced formally. Don't disgrace yourselves. Cloud saluted at the soldier, and they ran out of the changing room and down the corridor, taking the last door out towards the town. Cloud looked down at the gun in his hands as he ran, praying he knew just what he was getting into. End of chapter Episode 35, Part 03, Chapter 35 Chapter 35 The streets of Upper Janan were very busy as the final preparations for the welcoming parade were put into place. Several squadrons of Shinra soldiers had gathered on the main road that ran around the front of the town, continuously practicing their drilling as they waited for the parade to begin. The team leaders were bawling out orders at them, blowing harshly on their whistles with each order. As they were practicing a helicopter flew overhead, heading down towards the town center as it scanned the streets for signs of trouble. As far as the helicopter was concerned the streets were clear from trouble, for it was blind to see the activities that went on without it knowing. So the soldiers continued to practice in safety, until a blue soldier ran up from down the street and up to the leading squadron at the beginning of the long line of squadrons. Begin the welcome parade! The soldier shouted as he ran up. The leading red soldier nodded and turned to his squadron, giving a long, sharp blow on his whistle. The whistle echoed all the way down the road, and more whistles from the other squadron leaders began to ring all the way down the line. All at once the drilling soldiers fell silent and came to attention, awaiting the order to begin. Once the order had been given the parade began, and it was clear from the start how much effort they had put in to make this parade a true spectacle. The streets were alive in color as banners hung from buildings and across the roads, brightly colored confetti was thrown into the air, and balloons were released into the sky as the parade passed the many dozens of people that had lined the streets to catch a glimpse of the new Shinra president. Heidegger was leading the parade, walking in front of the parade car as it drove slowly through the streets. Rufus was standing up in the back of the car, waving to the people who were cheering back at him. More confetti was thrown into the air as the president passed by, and all in all Rufus looked very smug and superior as he drove on further through the streets. After the parade car at last came the soldiers, marching in groups behind the car, their guns positioned on their shoulders as they marched perfectly onward. Back in the parade square, Cloud and his group of soldiers had only just arrived to see that the entire square was empty of all soldiers. Oh. No. The red soldier exclaimed in horror, lifting up the visor of his helmet. No one's here. Late. He snapped the visor back down and turned to Cloud angrily. Hey, rookie. We're late cause you're running around like that. Cloud stopped walking and shrugged dismissively back at him. The red soldier was about to reprimand him, when one of the blue soldiers quickly interrupted him. Captain. We'll take a shortcut. The red soldier nodded. Right. Good idea. He turned back to the other soldiers and Cloud. Get over here. He called, and all the soldiers began to run down the main road towards an alley that lay a little further down. The Shinra officer stopped by the entrance and signaled for the others to go on ahead. All right. You first. He said as the soldiers went past. When they were all through he went down. The alley came out right into the middle of the parade between the groups of people that had gathered in the street. Right then the soldiers were passing by in their group teams, marching with pride behind the parade car. Cloud and the one remaining blue soldier stood just at the entrance of the alley as the groups marched by. One group was approaching them with a gap in the back line. The blue soldier spotted it and turned to Cloud. I'll got first. He said. Just watch and do as I do, rookie. Just sneak into the back of the line when you see an opening, okay? Cloud watched as the soldier turned back to the parade and lifted his gun up to his shoulder ready. As the squadron passed them by, the soldier quickly dashed into the road and ran to the back of the line. He slipped easily into the gap and quickly got in step, marching onwards past the crowds without them even noticing that he hadn't been there before. Cloud stepped out of the alley and shrugged. Now listen up. Cloud turned in surprise to see the officer standing behind him. This parade's gonna be broadcast live on Shinra TV, around the world. He said harshly. If you look bad, the whole Janan army will look bad. 
remember that and don't screw up. He peered out of the alley and back down the parade, trying to spot a squadron with a missing soldier. One was just approaching them, and he gave Cloud a gentle push to the street. Okay. Jump in when I give you the sign. And sneak in from the back. Don't mess up the row. And no matter what you do, don't try to go in from the front. All right. Start marching. Cloud did as he was told and began to march on the spot, feeling like a complete dork marching in the middle of the street. He prayed none of the others were watching him. The Shinra officer continued to look out of the alley until the squadron was close enough. Charge! He commanded. Immediately Cloud marched forward past the people gathered in the street, who were paying too much attention to the parade to notice him slipping by. He then marched into the road towards the back of the squadron, and quickly dashed round to the back of the line just as they began to pass the cameras that were filming them as they marched on by. Cloud tried to lift his gun up onto his shoulder, but the strap of the gun was entangled in his arm, and he struggled to get it free. One of the soldiers looked at Cloud angrily as he struggled with the strap of his gun, especially since now they were in full view of the cameras and they would be filming every second of it. A few citizens giggled in the streets as they watched Cloud finally release the strap of his gun and position it on his shoulder. Even so the cameras had caught everything, and that scene would be broadcast all over the world. Cloud didn't mind too much though. At least the mess up would make Shinra look bad. It worked, too. Up in the TV station that was monitoring the viewing ratings of the parade, the TV producer and his AD had seen every bit of Cloud's accidental mess up. What the heck was that soldier doing? The producer asked as he watched the squadron walk on by. I don't know, replied the AD. Are the points up? The AD looked down at the point ratings on his screen and swallowed nervously. This is terrible, he exclaimed, watching as the number of people watching on his screen went drastically down. Thanks to the mess up. Am. Am I fired? The TV producer leaned over and saw the number continuing to drop. What? He cried. You're fired. He threw his clipboard down onto the floor fiercely. Send that soldier a bomb or something. Back in Janon, the main part of the parade had come to an end, and a selected team of soldiers were giving a drilling presentation in front of Rufus and Heidegger. Rufus was watching with interest as the soldiers performed their skills for him, shifting their guns and turning to their commander's orders. Heidegger, on the other hand, was not at all impressed, and was scowling intensely. Cloud and the Red Shinra soldier ran up from the back of the road, and came to a stop near the drilling squadron. Good. We made it. The Shinra officer said with relief. He peered up over the top of the squadron, and quickly ducked back down. Oh. President Rufus. He looked around nervously, until he finally glared at Cloud. Hey! Line up and shut up! Don't make a move! He gave Cloud yet another harsh push towards the squadron, and Cloud quietly snuck in and stood in the middle of the group. He did absolutely nothing as the other soldiers continued to drill around him, although luckily their movements shielded his inactivity from Rufus. Moments later the performance finally came to an end, and the squadron came to a stop. The officer in charge then turned to Rufus and saluted. How's the job? asked Rufus as Heidegger also turned to him. Without a reply Rufus sighed heavily and turned away towards the lift that led to the other side of the town. He looked around, confused, and then turned back. What happened to the airship? he asked. The long-range airship is still being prepared, Heidegger replied. It should be ready in about three more days. Yaha ha ha Even the Air Force is Gelnica? Rufus asked. Heidegger laughed again, and Rufus looked at him irritably. Stop that stupid horse laugh! He commanded. Things are different than when father was in charge. Heidegger slowly stopped laughing and stood frozen to the spot. Rufus sighed again. Is the ship ready? Yes sir, we'll get it ready quickly, Heidegger replied, his voice quiet. Rufus then turned away and headed towards the lift. Once he had turned away Heidegger spun round and ran to the group of soldiers lined up in front of them. He began to beat them angrily out of sheer frustration, and each one of them flinched and shook in fright. Heidegger then punched Cloud, who didn't move. He glared at Cloud and hit him again, and then again. Each time Cloud did not move a muscle, and just took Heidegger's abuse. The lift started up then, and Heidegger turned and ran to it, climbing inside and leaving the soldiers behind. The moment Heidegger disappeared through the open doorway the lift headed up towards the town again, and the soldiers finally relaxed and gathered in a circle around Cloud. What a disaster, one of the blue soldiers commented. Heidegger was really irritated, said another. 
The man in the black cape's been roaming the city, but we can't find him, another one said. That caught Cloud's attention. Man in a black cape? He asked. A fourth soldier nodded. He showed up two or three days ago and killed a few of our soldiers, he said. He disappeared right after that, a fifth one said. There's a rumor going around that it was Sephiroth. Cloud listened to their words. It made sense. Sephiroth could have first arrived in Jinan two or three days ago on his way to Midgar to kill the president, former president, of Shinra, and to release Genova. Did that mean that Sephiroth had been hiding on the other continent until then? For five years. So now, was Sephiroth going back across the ocean to continue his search for the promised land? Attention! The officer commanded suddenly. Dismissed. The group of soldiers broke up and spread out away from Cloud, heading back to their changing rooms now that their job of welcoming the president was over. Only Cloud remained where he was, still lost in his thought. The officer looked at Cloud angrily, and marched up to him. Hey! Hey you! He snapped, and Cloud looked at him. You messing with the army? Cloud frowned. He didn't like the soldier's superior attitude. What if I am? He asked in reply. The officer scowled back at him, and Cloud longed to knock at superior smug off his shielded face. You're too lazy. The officer told him. No, break for you. Get over here. He took Cloud back to the changing rooms at the airfield again. As they entered the room the officer slammed the door shut, but Cloud didn't jump. The stuck-up soldier didn't at all intimidate him. Cloud figured he was probably just another one of those soldiers that were always trying to assert more authority than they actually held. This is the military, soldier. The officer said to him in a loud, commanding voice. Your orders for today are to send of President Rufus at the dock. He turned to Cloud and grinned slyly. I'll keep drilling you until it's time. The door to the changing rooms opened and once again the same two blue soldiers ran into the room, still as enthusiastic as ever. I'll help, sir. The first blue soldier said. Me too, sir. Said the other. Cloud could only stare at them. What was it with these two that they kept popping up everywhere? He prayed they wouldn't sing this time. All right. The officer said. Line up in order and show me your final pose. Today's command is formation. Remember it. The two soldiers lined up beside one another, and the officer held his whistle close to his mouth. Ready? Janon military send off, begin. He then blew on his whistle. The two soldiers began to turn and raise their guns in time to the officer's commands, each of which were followed by sharp blows from the whistle. After a minute of that the whistling began to hurt Cloud's ears, but at least he was picking up quickly on the orders as they were belted out. Cloud was very relieved when the drill came to an end, although he could still hear the whistle ringing in his ears. The officer turned to him. All right. The officer said. Now you try it. Before Cloud could even prepare himself the officer blew hard on the whistle, followed quickly by the first order. Cloud barely had time to lift his gun up by the time the next order was given and he had to turn around. The officer continued to shout out orders at him, trying to catch Cloud out with unexpected and quick orders. Yet Cloud was able to keep in time with him, just about, and didn't make a single mistake throughout the practice. Eventually, the officer blew hard on the whistle to signal the end of the drill and nodded slowly at Cloud, slightly impressed. I've got it! exclaimed Cloud. All right! the officer said. Don't mess up during the real thing! Commander! called one of the blue soldiers. What's today's special pose? The officer stopped and thought for a moment, tapping his foot on the ground. Hey! I haven't decided yet! He admitted. He looked down a little more, before his gaze lifted to Cloud and he smiled. All right, rookie. I'll let you decide. Show me your best move. Cloud thought for a moment. Let's see. My best move is... He clenched his left fist and raised it up to the air twice before lifting his gun with his other hand and spinning it round above his head, finishing it off by putting the gun over his shoulder and behind his back. The soldiers all stared in awe as he finished. Wow! One of them exclaimed. That's awesome! said the other. All right! the officer said, bringing them back to reality. We'll go with that as today's special. Practice it! Yes sir! 
the soldier said excitedly, and immediately began to practice Cloud's complex move. Cloud watched them as they practiced, they weren't too bad at it, he figured. The officer watched them as well, before he looked at his watch. Well then. Meet at the dock. Don't be late. He ordered them. Attention. Dismissed. At his command, the soldiers all dispersed from the changing room and headed back onto the main road to rush for the docks. Cloud went with them, the closer to the docks he was the easier it would be to sneak on board and get across the continent. Even as he ran after the soldiers, he began to think about the others. He hoped that they had somehow managed to sneak through the Shinra without getting caught. The road was empty now that the parade was over, and the soldiers ran quickly past the dimly lit buildings and shops to get to the docks before the send-off began. Cloud nearly stopped at one point as they passed one building, for he spotted a familiar figure walking up to the door. It was Rude of the Turks. Rude looked over as he and the other soldiers ran on past, but he didn't recognize Cloud through the Shinra uniform, and went into the building and out of sight, and the soldiers ran on. They had to cross the lifts to get to the other side of the town, but once they had crossed it was easy running to the end of the road where the large Shinra ship was standing, waiting to set sail across the ocean. The back of the ship was open and waiting, with a single blue soldier guarding its entrance. The Shinra officer ran up in front of the ship and turned as Cloud and the other soldiers ran up and got in line in front of him, ready for the send-off. All right, it's time. He announced. President Rufus has now arrived called the Blue Soldier. Cloud looked through the shadow of his visor as Rufus and Heidegger walked out of the hangar and onto the docks. Rufus had a very serious expression on his face, which was probably why Heidegger had been looking and acting so edgy during the parade. Ten. Hut. Commanded the officer. The three soldiers in front of him immediately came to attention. Rufus stopped near to them and watched. This is it. The officer whispered sharply to his soldiers. Janon Military Reception. Do it right. Do it with enthusiasm. Ready. He blew on his whistle and the demonstration began. The officer barked out his orders, and the two soldiers obeyed them with immense enthusiasm, and even Cloud tried his best, even if it was just to prevent Rufus and Heidegger becoming suspicious. As they drilled Cloud's gaze wandered over to the ship's entrance, where he was sure he had seen a flash of movement, if just for a second. His attention was brought back to the drill as the officer barked out his last order, the order for their final pose. All at once Cloud and the two soldiers performed the pose, until coming to a finish. The Shinra officer then turned round and saluted to Rufus, before they all stood at ease in front of the president. Rufus stepped forward towards them and clapped, clearly impressed. Well done, he said to them. Keep up the good work for Shinra, Inc. Heidegger then walked forward to each of the soldiers in turn, whispering something in their ears and giving them a little something. He stopped in front of Cloud. Yeah ha ha! He laughed. Here's a special bonus for you. A token of the President's kindness. Don't forget it. He then dropped a small bag of gill into Cloud's hands, and Cloud smirked underneath his visor. He watched silently as Rufus then turned away and stepped up onto the ship, Heidegger right behind him, but Cloud could still hear what they were saying. Once the word gets out that Sephiroth's here, Cloud and his friends will show up, too, Rufus said to Heidegger quietly. We'll crush them as soon as soon as we find them. Heidegger assured him. Rufus looked at Heidegger closely. We can't have them get in our way, he said sternly. Heidegger swallowed nervously, and nodded his head. Leave it up to me, sir. Ha ha ha. Again Rufus glared at Heidegger irritably. I thought I told you to stop that stupid laugh. He repeated, and Heidegger immediately stopped laughing. Without another word Rufus walked off and into the ship, passing the large pile of crates that had been loaded on board for the journey across the ocean. Once the president was safely inside Heidegger turned and signaled to the soldiers in the hangar before following the president inside and out of sight. Moments later the loud booming of the ship's horn could be heard in the air as the ship made its final preparations before setting sail. All right. Dismissed. The officer called. All at once Cloud and the other soldiers were finally able to relax. After all the standing and drilling and marching and singing, their arms and legs were aching terribly. Yet they couldn't help but feel somewhat energized as well after being applauded by the new president, and even given a bonus because of it. Still they were glad it was all over, and they were able to relax. That was close, the first blue soldier said, sighing with relief. Heidegger's been really edgy lately, said the second. 
because Hojo disappeared leaving a letter of resignation, the first explained. Heidegger's been forced to take care of that investigation, too, said the second. Hey! The officer snapped at them. I thought you were dismissed. The two blue soldiers jumped about half a meter in the air and quickly ran off back to the hangar, leaving the officer behind with Cloud. We got some cleaning up to do. He said. Hurry up! He then ran off into the hangar, leaving Cloud behind. Cloud waited until all of the soldiers on the dock had left and run back inside, before he finally relaxed and sighed heavily. By now the gun was heavy in his hands, and he longed to take off the helmet and get some fresh air for a change. Being in the uniform was beginning to make him feel sick to his stomach, and he couldn't wait to get out of it and back into his usual clothes again. He ignored the sickening feeling in his stomach and headed towards the ship, keeping an eye out for any soldiers. Hey, hurry! You're the last one! Cloud jumped in surprise and looked towards the crates piled near the entrance. He leaned in closer and Red 13 walked out quietly from behind the crates where he had been hiding. So it was Red 13 he had seen moving behind the crates when he had been drilling, it wasn't his imagination. How did you get here? Cloud asked him. A dolphin gave me a ride, Red 13 replied. He looked around either end of the ship, just making sure that there was no one else listening. Priscilla remembered the dolphin after you climbed the pole. But, you mustn't be mad at her. Cloud shrugged dismissively and shook his head. It didn't really matter how they all got up to the upper city, as long as they were all safely on board and out of view of the Shinra. Even so he would have loved to see Red 13 trying to get up on the dolphin's back. He then stepped up onto the ship and stood beside Red 13, looking out at the docks one last time. As they waited the ship's engine then hummed into life, and the gentle roar of the working parts could be heard echoing beneath them. The doors then began to scrape and rise up off the docks, sealing Cloud and Red 13 inside the Shinra ship. We'll cross the ocean, to the new continent, said Cloud as the doors closed. Even if we are wearing Shinra uniforms. End of chapter